Throughout history, there are defining moments, points in time when humankind take great leaps forward. The constant struggle in which the wage earners of our country are continually engaged for the attainment of their rights and the mitigation of the wrongs they daily endure renders it essential that they organize and unite in one common brotherhood regardless of nationality, creed, or color. About the turn of the last century, the plight of working people was in a state of flux. As North American cities were taking shape and as industry was changing everything, immigrants flocked to these shores in search of a better way of life. The labor movement has for its purpose the securing of the best possible economic and social conditions for the masses and the attainment of these with the least possible friction. The call went out and on April 13, 1903, in a small room of the American Federation of Labor headquarters at 425 G Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., 25 delegates from 17 cities representing 23 different locals met to form a new international union of hod carriers and building laborers. The first general president was a Belgian immigrant who had led a group of laborers from Chicago. His name was Herman Lilly. So help me God. We hold that all men are created free and equal, that honor and merit make the man, that self-preservation is the first law of nature, and that those who would be free must first strike the blow. With the new international union established, the real work was just beginning. It wasn't earth-shaking or glamorous, but it was important bringing independent locals into the fold, organizing unrepresented hod carriers and laborers, helping to settle jurisdictional disputes, providing support for locals on strike, and above all, providing support to affiliates in collective bargaining for better wages and working conditions, as well as shorter working hours. The union became an advocate for workers before the government, seeking legislation that would abolish child labor and other forms of exploitation, and establish an eight-hour day, job safety, and compensation for workers injured on the job. As the second decade of the 20th century was drawing to a close, the International Hod Carriers Building and Common Laborers Union was broadening its scope and jurisdiction. In an effort to consolidate all workers of similar crafts under one banner, the International eventually merged with unions representing cement workers, laborers who paved roads, laborers who built factories, mills, and shipyards, and with members of the International Compressed Air and Foundation Workers Union, known as the Sand Hogs. With the end of World War I, North America moved into a new era. Within the building trades, the jurisdiction of laborers was gaining acceptance among the various crafts unions, and in 1920, membership in the hod carriers, building, and common laborers had reached almost 80,000. In October of 1929, the bottom fell out of the U.S. economy. During the Great Depression, unemployment soared and membership in all unions plummeted. Working people suffered regardless of the industry. But even in these dark days, there were some bright moments. Within months of the crash, construction began on Hoover Dam, a public works project that employed more than 5,000 construction workers seven days a week for almost five years. And less than two years later, Congress would pass and President Hoover would sign the Davis-Bacon Act, requiring contractors on federal construction projects to pay at least the prevailing wage in the area where the work is performed. In Washington, the Depression would sweep into power a new administration committed to a new deal for working men and women, and none too soon for the hod carriers building in common laborers. By Inauguration Day 1933, membership in the union had fallen to a 20-year low. As the new administration launched a host of programs and projects to put America to work, 
The union's leadership at all levels worked tirelessly to ensure that work within the laborers' jurisdiction would be done by laborers' union members. As the Depression waned, the world's attention was drawn to a new threat rearing its head in Europe. Soon, the U.S. and Canada would be drawn into another world war. Young men hurried to answer the call to service, and eventually, some 100,000 laborers would participate in the conflict. The Laborers' Executive Board was quick to pass a resolution supporting the war effort. More than 20% of laborers' union membership served in the armed forces. The nation's construction program accelerated, and laborers' membership at home climbed to 430,000 in 1942. The era of Eisenhower, Bobby Sox, Red Scares, and rock and roll also was a time of prosperity for the laborers' union and the rest of organized labor. It gave rise to national agreements between unions and key employer groups in the pipeline and railroad industries, expanding work opportunities into traditionally non-union outlying areas. It marked the 50th anniversary of the laborers' union and the merger of the AFL and CIO. And in 1957, construction began on the union's permanent headquarters building in Washington, D.C. But the 1960s marked a genuine coming of age for the laborers. Shortly after the new Moreshi building was dedicated, the union began a concerted campaign to organize public employees, state employees, health care workers, and others. The Laborers' Political League was established to give its members a strong voice with lawmakers and government leaders. In 1965, the union officially changed its name to the Laborers' International Union of North America. And in 1968, following two years of negotiations, the laborers welcomed the 20,000 members of the National Postal Mail Handlers Union into the Lyuna ranks. The laborers were becoming bigger and more than their name, a truly diverse union. By the end of the 60s, unlike every other building trades union, Lyuna embraced minorities who made up more than one-third of its members. Members worked in a variety of fields and positions. But even in construction, something had changed. Lyuna and its contractors formed a partnership to provide skills training for laborers. This gave birth to the Laborers AGC Education and Training Fund in 1969. Though the 1970s opened with passage of the law establishing the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, an unsettling trend would begin to develop during the decade. Government was becoming increasingly unfriendly to the labor movement. In 1971, President Nixon suspended the federal prevailing wage law, only to have the courts reinstated a month later. With administration encouragement, the Business Roundtable was formed to expand the non-union sector in the construction industry. And President Ford vetoed common situs picketing, despite approval by both houses of Congress. With the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, the trend would continue with a vengeance. His firing of the striking air traffic controllers and decertification of their union served as a signal to employers that it was open season on the labor movement. While the laborers' union continued to weather these storms everywhere, its fortunes were particularly bright in Canada. Between 1970 and 1981, membership there increased more than tenfold, from 5,000 to 55,000. Lyuna launched some bold initiatives in the 1980s, none more significant than establishing two key funds, the Laborers' Health and Safety Fund of North America, to focus on the health and safety of members on and off the job, and the Laborers' Employers' Cooperation and Education Trust to formalize a cooperative relationship between our union and our employers to maximize work opportunities for both. Along with the Laborers' AGC Education and Training Fund, they have become known as the tri Fund. and through the 90s and into the new century, they have become a critical component of this truly unique union. In 1994, after almost a century of establishing a reputation and decades of creating an exemplary training program, the Laborers' Union received much-deserved recognition. 